And I think that is one of the problems we do have. Yes, yeah, so uh, well, you know, remember when I first started our interactions with WTPN and building religious and how and your organization, the first thing I was told was, you cannot discuss religion if you're going to discuss politics. And yeah. I was, I, it was really surprising because we are, to, we are there to discuss Middle Eastern politics. And how can you discuss politics without talking about religion in the Middle East? That's really, that's really not real. It's not sincere. Yeah, it's, what it is is a difference of cultures because in America, the, you know, freedom, yes, is I am all for freedom and personal liberties. Anybody that knows me that listens to our shows know that I am also uh, what a lot of people would call a patriot as far as freedom and liberty. Personal freedoms and personal liberty, you know, around the world are what set us, you know, that that's what makes us individuals and that's what gives us what we can to pass on to other people and they learn from us even as as the Quran says you know that we've been separated in different tribes so that we might come to know each other it doesn't say that we're all one people so that we know each other and this is for a reason because we all have something to teach each other and if we all have the same state of mind then I think life would be quite boring but in America the the idea of religion and politics I think is there's a lot of romanticism that is added into that. And I know a lot of people hear me use that word a lot because it really covers a lot. Because when you add romanticism in to a culture that has romanticized politics and that has grew basically grown up learning that politics and religion do not mix, they don't understand that other cultures, that this is not the case, that religion and politics are closely related in other in other societies. And they think, well, the first thing they think of is, well, you have religion and politics, you have oppression. Well, that is not the religion that's in the politics that's the oppression. It's the people that are in those politics that are using the religion in that way. Yes, and if we are going to go back to the problem in the Muslim world and the unity, Raja, you were talking about, I also think we also support that the problem in the Muslim world is the need of a leader and a united character of the Muslim world, because there is no leader in the Muslim world right now, and bigotry which disturbs people and scares them stems from lack of leadership in the region. There is no leader. There is no uh, spiritual leader. There is no leader country. There is no leading union in the region. There is no uh, leader in the region. So all communities in the world have a leader. Christians have a leader. Jews have a leader. Freemasons, Templars have their leaders. Satanists have their leaders. Even ants and bees have a leader. So. Muslims don't have a leader, and it's also uh, almost been a century, and this is also creating a very big problem in the Muslim world. That's why we are supporting a union. I'm sure you have heard about it, or maybe you have. It's Turkish Islamic Union, and it's not an arbitrary or political union. It's not in the sense of oppressing other people or other countries who are not in the union, and it covers everyone in the region. It covers all Muslim countries or Turkey countries, including Azerbaijan, Afghanistan. It covers also Armenia and Israel because they're in the region and they will be under the protection of the same union. And in the, when we are in the same union, the conflicts will be solved by itself. You know, I agree with you because there's no leader in the Muslim world. As an individual or as a, as a country or as a society or as a group of people, we do not have any leadership mm-hmm. in the Muslim world. You are... 100% right in saying so. And uh, there are multiple reasons that why, why we do not have the leadership of that kind that we desire or we should have. Of because course. the leadership is not being allowed to be cultivated by the forces that oppose us. You know, when Soviet Union collapsed, at that time, NATO had become redundant, you know. So mm-hmm. there was somebody who, uh, some journalist who asked a question to the United, uh, the NATO secretary. He said, no, since the Soviet Union is gone, or there is no need of uh, NATO. They said, no, the color of the enemy has changed from red to green. Now we'll be focusing more on green. So it is a complete shift from uh, the uh, facing of the hostilities or war or uh, targeting the society. Previously, they were working on communism. They used the Muslim society to fight communism. Once communism was done, now they have come to face the Muslim society directly. And uh, through and one of their tools is a very effective tool that is divide and rule. So they have created all sorts of uh, 
divisions within the Muslim society, the sectarian divisions, the uh, country, uh, the uh, regional divisions, and things like that, you know. When I hear the word Arab and the Muslim world, it hurts me, you know. Why are they being treated as two different worlds, Arab and the Muslim world? Arabs are Muslims, Muslims are Muslims, they're non-Arab Muslims and they're Arab Muslims. So they all form part of the Muslim world. So it should be rephrased and recoined as a, totally as a Muslim world. Arab mm -hmm. society is also part of the Muslim society and the non-Arab society is also part of the Muslim society. So they should be taken as one because we have one faith, we believe in one religion, we believe in one God and we believe in the same prophet. So That's why are they true. make sort of things? And then they created the Arab nationalism, you know. So that yes. was again a ploy to keep the Muslims divided, the Arab nationalism. Arab nationalism has become the source of destruction of the Muslim society. Through Arab and nationalism, they destroyed the Ottoman Empire. And the destruction of the Ottoman Empire uh, deprived the Muslim society of any leadership that we had. Mm -hmm. Now, coming back to this thing that what I suggested in that paper that the Muslims of the world should unite, that was my interview with Faris News Agency of uh, Iran. I said we should have, not through the government, uh, not at the government level, no. I will not trust the governments of the Muslim world any longer because they don't represent us. I would rather go for a track which is absolutely independent of the government. Uh, mm -hmm. The Muslim scholars were, no matter which country they are, even if they are sitting in America, they are sitting in Russia, they are sitting in uh, Pakistan or any other country, they must get together, they must hold a conference, uh, let's say 100, 100, 150 or 200 of those such scholars. And uh, they should then evolve a joint strategy. The day those scholars get together and then they start to uh, meet regularly, then I would say the Muslim leadership will start to emerge. Because mm -hmm. leadership will not, emerge, uh, not fall from the blue. We have to work in that direction to evolve that leadership. leadership. So this is very essential that when I say that the Muslims of the world should unite, I am not trying to unite them in the terms of war or destruction of the other world, no. No, of course not. I am trying not. to unite them uh, so that they, they, at least they can defend themselves, their ideology, their, uh, their life, their property, their everything, you know. Because we have to live as a respectable society. And I believe in love and peace and harmony within different societies. Mm -hmm. So, unless we unite, unless we have our own uh, ideas and things clear, we cannot achieve that. Yes, and Raja, you know, I'm also a very devout Muslim. And uh, I know that this is uh, coming to the Muslim world because of the lack of union. Because, you know, in a verse, Allah says, Obey Allah and His Messenger and do not quarrel among yourselves or you lose heart and your momentum disappears. And we are not united and Muslim world is quarreling among themselves and their momentum disappears. They don't have any strength because they are not united. And this is Allah's promise and Allah is fulfilling His promise. And this can be America, this can be Russia, this can be China. Allah uh, can create any force when we are not united. So it is upon us to be united. And to tell the truth, we hold a lot of meetings in Washington, in Israel, in a lot of places. And they, they have no opposition right now for a union in the region. They are seeking this union because they also need this union. Because they are also suffering from the bigotry stemming in the uh, Muslim lands. And they are also uncomfortable with this. But they also started to realize that only a true spiritual leader or a, a union in the region can tackle this problem. So they are seeking to establish a union here. But the problem actually is in the Muslim world. We are not united. We are not seeking to be united. For example, you go to Palestine, there's a big problem in Palestine and the occupation, of course. But they are, they are seeking to only free Palestine. Uh, Syrians only, are only seeking to free Syria. Afghans are only seeking to free Afghanistan. There are few people who think like you and I and uh, we as an organization. Because we cannot solve the problem if we don't uh, look at the problem as a whole. The problem is not regional. It's a global problem. We cannot be strong enough if we don't unite. If we focus on solving a problem in one single place, we will never solve it because it will start again after we solve it. We have to solve it in a, in a global perspective. We should unite all Muslims. We should unite all the region. 
including everyone in the region. So you are right, and I really appreciate your insight on this. And, you know, you talked about Arab nationalism. It also stems from Darwinism, Darwinistic materialistic philosophy. And this is what is called nationalism in the Arab land and Arab socialism, as we call it. Because, you know, all the dictators in the Arab land were socialists. It was a Marxist regime ruling in the Arab, Arab land. It wasn't an Islamic regime. It's also not an Islamic regime right now in Iran. How can it be Islamic regime when you cannot teach creation in their schools? People think Islamic rules are being practiced there, and there's an Islamic rule in Iran. However, the communist bloc has included Iran. Although it looks like there is Islam in Iran, communism rules behind the scenes, and uh, communist thinking predominates. They carried out that revolution together with the Communist Party in France. And it's clear from the name, even revolution. How can there be a revolution in Islam? Our prophet didn't come to a revolution. You can have uprisings and things like that, but Iran is in collaboration with whatever communist countries there are in the world. And they are a block. And while there appears to be a Shi Jafari system in Iran, it's communist thinking that rules because the state imposes the teaching of Darwinism and materialism to the students. And you can feel the communism even in the style that students adopt. I'm sure you've been there and you have seen this too. And we have to teach people the real essence of Quran so that they will leave traditionalism and they will be more religious again. Uh, I, I, I totally, I completely agree with you. You know, there is a saying of Prophet Muhammad Wasallam that the Muslim Ummah is like a body. Mm -hmm. If there is pain in one part of the body, the whole body pains, you know. Yes. So, it is not something that, I am just supporting your point of view, it is not something that we can deal in isolation. No, Palestinian issue cannot be dealt in isolation. Afghan situation cannot be dealt in isolation. What is happening in Kashmir? cannot be dealt in isolation, or what is happening in Myanmar, the formerly known as Burma, cannot be dealt in isolation. We all have to form a joint strategy as to how to protect the interests of the Muslim community the world over, because all Muslims are one body. But the point is this, that through this divide and rule, this one body has been splintered into various uh, smaller segments, uh, segments within segments, and that is not letting them unite. So this is where the uh, an, an enormous responsibility would fall upon the scholars and the educators to yes. educate the Muslim society in a manner that they overcome such barriers and such divisions, and then they start to bring uh, to form into one body. And this will not happen overnight. This will not happen with any uh, magic wand or anything like that. You know, it has to be a well thought out strategy, a well uh, orchestrated, uh, uh, orchestrated strategy that has to be uh, taught in the schools and colleges and the societies over yes. a period of time. So right now what is happening that from most of the Muslim countries, the Islamic teachers are being taken away. They are not, they are, uh, the books, uh, or the uh, quotations from Holy Quran and from the Hadith, they are being taken out. So they, are, they no longer form part of the curriculum in the schools and colleges. So this is, the enemies are moving in a very, very effective manner and they are trying to do what they want to do. And we are just playing as puppets in their hands, we have just become pawns in their hands. The whole, another problem is that the most of the Muslim governments, I would say, I won't call them leadership because they are not leaders. They are the governments that have been installed on us. They mm -hmm. do not represent the people of their countries, they represent they are like voice rise or the governors or the people sitting elsewhere and uh, doing their job in, the, in these countries, you know. Yeah, the, uh, yes. I want to bring the American side into this because there are a lot of ties that I think people need to put together here that we also have the same problem here in our school. And I hadn't really thought of it before until Jalon had just said so, but the, the communistic value behind taking creationism out of teaching, that really struck me when you said that, Jalon, because the the way things are here in America in the at school education, if you mention teaching evolution, or not evolution, I'm sorry, but if you mention teaching creationism in schools here, people want to prosecute you for that here. Literally. Uh, I mean, literally, take you to court know, and prosecute yeah. you for that. And that uh, is a real big problem here, too, because the the thing of it is, is without having the opportunity to get that education 
of, and I believe that, that all faith should be educated in. I'm not saying to teach everybody this faith or that faith. What I'm saying is to educate people in these faiths. Yes, as a general knowledge. Yes, exactly. Because without having that knowledge and growing up with that knowledge and growing up knowing about religion and what religion is and knowing about Allah and, and even people that I've had a lot of discussion lately and talked to a lot of people that and Jay Long was in on one discussion the other day on an, on an article that I wrote and the lady said well that Allah is not the same God that I worship and that is such a misconception because even the word Allah is you know God is one one God um, the even the the Bible, the Christian Bible, even states that God is one God. He is the only God. And just because it's of a different language, they want to disassociate it with that. And part of that is because of a lack of religious education. Whether it be, you know, they, they teach evolution, but they don't want to teach creationism. And they fight it so hard that I don't know why more people don't see that if they're fighting against something so hard, why are they so scared of that? If it's you know if it's something that's that's meaningless to these people that say it doesn't need to be taught in school, then why are they so scared of it being there? And I, of course we know the reason of that because if everybody was educated in religion, they would know that a lot of what we have in politics now is not so much as you said leadership for the people because all over the world this is going on that the governments are disconnected with the people almost in every country and and actually I I can say that that Turkey is actually one of the closer ones to being connected to the people there. But I know, and if you look at the UK and Spain and Greece and Africa and America and Canada, there are so many separations between the public and the, the political arena that I agree with you completely that it's not a government for the people. It's a government that's been implemented there to rule over these people to try and implement plans of what I call the elite. 